Good morning. Good morning, Bart. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, good. Nice to see you. Oh, can you see me? <laughs> yep, I, I can see you. Can you see me? Uh, hold on. Let me see if I can get this up here. Ah, there you go. Yeah, got okay. it. Good, Hello. good, 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 good. Yep, yeah. you, you sound good. We are recording. We're off and rolling. You're at home, I presume, at your home office, it looks like? This is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Lots of good Bible books back there. <laughs> oh, guys, I can't have enough of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, congratulations on the new book. Uh, Thank it look, you. It looks great. It's doing well. I see on Amazon you got a high ranking and a beautiful review in the New York Times. Uh, yes. The little the little orange dot does not come with the purchased ones. That <laughs> that's the uh, yeah, yeah. that's the right. review copy. How a forbidden religion swept the world. I I should note that uh, I didn't actually read it this way. I read it this way. Uh, ah, okay, on, yeah, on so. audio. So your reader is good, and um, I should note also I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan of teaching company courses. Oh uh, yeah, I've taken a few of yours. Uh, let me just for our listeners remind them you've done. Uh, this is teach12.com or the great courses you've done, the history of the Bible, the making of the New Testament canon, the New Testament, from Jesus to Constantine, the historical Jesus, after the New Testament, uh, the writing, oh, the Apostolic Fathers, the greatest controversies in early Christian history, how Jesus became God, and the lost Christianities. And uh, I've taken a couple of those. Um, if, if people are not familiar with the teaching company, um, these are typically 30-minute lectures, and you can just hammer through them even at like 1.5 or 1.25 speed and, and get through in like 20 minutes a, a lecture on a drive. Ah. It's, a, it's a great way ah. to do a commute. Uh, I've never, uh, never done it that way. That's a good idea. Oh, oh yeah, because uh, most, most lecturers, um, the, the, the speed at which they lecture for teaching company courses is a little slow if yeah. you're just driving. You can absorb quite a bit more at yeah. a higher yeah. speed. So I usually listen to, to a 1.5. And, um, yeah, and, and then the other thing that most people don't know about is that Amazon and Audible, uh, you know, they're under the same corporate umbrella now. And so um, if you are, a, a, along with, the, te the teaching company has a deal with both of them. So if you are a member of audible.com where you buy audiobooks, you, you buy a membership for the year, it's like $224 and you get 24 books or 25 books. So it's less than $10 a book. But what most people don't know is you can buy an entire teaching company course for one credit, one book credit, which is less ah. than 10 bucks. So instead of paying $225 for a course or even discounted at $50 for a course, you can get it for $9.95 for an entire course. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it's totally wow. legal. I mean, you just all you do is you just go into audible.com and type in the name of the course, like one of your courses, and you can buy it for the cost of a book. Now, so I'm not trying to cut into your profits or anything because I don't get paid no, for this. <laughs> but I just think it's yeah. a great um, this is a great yeah. way to, to spend time. I mean, podcasts and the kind of thing we're doing here, you know, people will consume mostly audio. We're recording it on video in case anybody wants to watch it. But but most most people listen to these kinds of things while they're driving, vacuuming, uh, you know, doing chores, working out, right. Right. that sort right. of thing. And I find it, you know, a really useful um, tool to to absorb a lot of information. So, uh, but before we get into the weeds of your uh, of, of your argument in, in the new book, again, just to remind everybody, it's the triumph of Christianity: how a forbidden religion swept the world. I've, I've been watching the uh, Paramount Studios uh, series Waco, a six-part series on how the, the Branch Davidians and that whole disaster with um, with the federal government. And uh, I was just trying to think of an analogy to, to, to get us started here. It would be like the couple dozen people in, in Mark, Mount Carmel in, in Waco, Texas, all of a sudden, you know, within a couple of centuries, they have two billion followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how it, this just sounds insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. because you know anybody who's a leader of a, of a sect or cult like that has got to have he's got to be out there a little bit, uh, you know, in terms of the acceptance of most people. So uh, it, it's an interesting problem that you're tackling, and, and uh, I had no idea there was so much literature on this. Uh, you know how how a religion grows, just extra biblical. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that, um, just get, give our listeners who are not familiar with you, I mean, most atheists know your work, um, and they love the story about how you went to uh, Wheaton Bible College, and, and were going to be a preacher, and then you went to Princeton Theological and found out how the sausages are made. <laughs> <laughs> and, and frankly, I, I, I've often said this, I don't know how anybody could take one of your teaching company courses or read one of your books and, and still be a believer afterwards. I mean, maybe it's uh -huh. the, 
confirmation bias and they only listen to what they want to hear. Yeah. Uh, but to tell us a little bit about your journey of how you went from evangelical believer to religious scholar and, and you're an atheist or agnostic or whatever you are now. Yeah, so uh, it's obviously it's a, yeah, it's a 62-year story, but uh, the, the short of it is uh, I was raised a Christian. My parents uh, went to the Episcopal Church in Lawrence, Kansas, where I grew up, and uh, I was a fairly religious kid, but uh, when I was about 15, I became even more religious. I, I had a born-again experience and uh, became a conservative evangelical Christian, and uh, when I graduated from high school, I went off to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which is a fundamentalist Bible college, uh, was there, did my diploma, did a degree there, and... Uh, oh, Moody, uh, that's right, yeah, yeah. Well, but I went from there to Wheaton. Oh, you so did? Okay, both. all right. Yeah. So, so Moody was Moody was kind of like fundamentalist boot camp for three years, mm -hmm. and uh, Wheaton was a conservative evangelical um, liberal arts college. Uh, and I took Greek at Wheaton, and uh, because I wanted to read the New Testament in the original Greek, and uh, because I was, I was a firm believer that the Bible had no mistakes of any kind whatsoever in it, <laughs> and I wanted to read what the original words were, and so I took Greek to do that, and. Uh, it turned out I was pretty good in Greek and decided I wanted to do a Ph.D. studying the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Um, the world expert on that was a man named Bruce Metzger, who taught at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. And so I went off to Princeton Seminary to, uh, to study Greek manuscripts with him. Uh, and it was in the course of my studies there at Princeton Seminary uh, that I started uh, engaging with a more critical scholarship on the Bible, where I started realizing that... Uh, uh, my earlier fundamentalism uh, had problems with it. Uh, I started finding that, in fact, there are discrepancies in the Bible and contradictions and historical mistakes and geographical errors and uh, all sorts of problems. Um, and so eventually, over a period of some years, I, I left my evangelical faith, and uh, I remained a liberal Christian for a long time. Um, I think, you know, when you say that my, my teaching courses would make anybody an agnostic, I think that, you know, it... That kind of information does make people agnostic. A lot of liberal Christians don't have much of a problem with with, uh, with my views of the Bible because they're the views that are taught at liberal theological seminaries. Nice. So, right. You know, these people aren't, uh, you know, they're not Bible thumping uh, Christians. They're they're people who have a more kind of uh, uh, modern understanding of the world and uh, their place in it. Uh, but I, so I became a liberal Christian, and I was that for a number of years. Um, the reason I ended up becoming uh, uh, an agnostic and an, and an atheist is uh, unrelated to uh, to my biblical scholarship. Uh, it's because I finally got to a point where I just uh, couldn't explain the problem of suffering in the world and, oh, and right. why there's so much pain and misery if there's supposed to be a God who's in charge. Right. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't look like there's a God in charge, and uh, I ended up probably about 20 years ago then uh, leaving the faith altogether. So the problem of evil was the biggest crux for you. But, yeah, much, in, in terms of faith at all, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, my belief in the Bible got, got a torpedo earlier than that because of my, yeah. my research. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it really was the problem of evil that did it. I think so, too. I've never heard a good explanation. I've, I've listened to people like William Lane Craig and, you know, march through their arguments for why evil is, you can you can square that circle with an all-powerful guy. I just, it does, doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think it ever could be uh, resolved that way. But uh, we should note, parenthetically, the purpose of your work is not to deconvert people at all. You're just you're a professional historian and scholar, yeah. and you just <laughs> want to know the truth about the yeah. past to the extent that we can understand it. That's right. And so you know, I, I, a lot of conservative Christians get upset with my work, and they think that I'm out to destroy their faith, and that it just isn't true. I mean, I. Uh, my my goal, I mean, it's like your goal, and it's to make people more intelligent about what they think. And uh, to, you know, if they're going to be believers, they should be uh, informed believers instead of ignorant believers. Uh, I think uh, having some knowledge is a good thing. <laughs> Always, yes. You know, it, uh, I think we're about the same age. I'm 63, and, and uh, you know, I went to Pepperdine University uh, in Malibu, the first uh, oh, yeah, first right. four-year graduating class. That's a Church of Christ school. It was very yeah, conservative. Yeah. Very conservative at the time. We um, uh, we were not allowed. To, no dancing was allowed on campus. You weren't yeah. allowed in the girls' dorms, and vice yeah. versa. And um, President Ford spoke at the university, and and it, it was. I was totally into it at the time. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, but then when I, uh, and I really hadn't thought much about the, the, the problem of evil and that sort of thing. I took courses in the Old Testament, New Testament. We're required to take two Bible classes and go to chapel once a week. I don't think they have to do that anymore. Um, and, uh, and then I took a course in the writings of C.S. Lewis. So I read everything Lewis wrote and, uh, you know, he's a beautiful writer and I can see the power of it. But then when I went to a secular uh, university after that for graduate school in experimental psych, um, it wasn't that um, there were a bunch of atheists there and, and they were bashing religion. It, it, in this, this was in the 70s. No one even talked about it. It was like a yeah. non-event. It was like, who cares? Yeah. Know, the, the culture we have now where it's you know this militant atheism and militant theism and this polarizing war, this yeah. war between science and religion, this really didn't exist then. And yeah. I, I remember getting there thinking, no one really cares about any of this stuff. And, and yeah. life goes on. They're happy and living fulfilled lives without religion. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and then yeah. so when I encountered your work in the '90s, I, I, I know a lot of a atheists loved it because uh, of its implications. Uh, but then, then it w when atheism became more a polarizing thing in the 2000s after 9/11 and all that, Dawkins' God delusion and the, the new atheists and all that, I noticed that some there were some attacks on you for like defending the, the possibility that someone named Jesus actually existed because there's this <laughs> branch of atheists that you know he didn't even exist the whole thing is a myth and if you defend his existence you're somehow in the wrong camp yeah 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 no it's uh it was you know for years I'd been attacked by conservative evangelicals which I kind of expected but then uh so I wrote this book on did Jesus exist where I showed why he almost certainly existed and I've never experienced the vitriol uh, like this before. <laughs> the, the atheists are far more aggressive than, uh, yes. you know, when I'm, when I'm an atheist. <laughs> but boy, yeah, so if you think that Jesus existed, oh man, yeah, you're bad news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate across the board, I think, because uh, I've, I've been on the receiving end of attacks for other reasons by my own people. A much worse, yeah. a much worse treatment than any I've gotten from from Christians or Holocaust deniers or climate deniers or anti-vaxxers, any people I've debunked, uh, yeah. they're usually polite to me. And yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when I when I debate Christians, you know, they couldn't be more polite. And I, I've been in churches where you know they come up to me and thank me and pray for me, you know the whole thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah. the you know a lot of these atheists, they're you know they're bad news. And uh, yeah, they, uh, yeah, no, they they can be quite harsh. And uh, yeah, and I mean you know the rep some of the representatives uh, clearly so, but even a lot of yeah, I mean yeah, I mean it, you know a lot of it just is driven by personality, obviously. I mean, yeah. I also think um, uh, that social movements tend to go through these purging stages, like mm. like like feminists are going through that a little bit now with the Me Too movement. You know, there's kind of polarizing and, and, and branching off and purging of people that are not true feminists or you're the wrong kind of feminist. I noticed that with socialists. Uh, e even uh, when I was at Pepperdine, Ayn Rand, objectivism was a big thing. Everybody oh, read yeah. Atlas Shrugged at Pepperdine. I mean, it was all anybody yeah. talked about, right? And then, yeah. then there was like a purging of her own movement. I saw after that, like who was the uh, who was the pure objectivist, you know, who was a true free market capitalist, you know, and yeah. and if you saw the wrong movies or you listened to the wrong music, you're out. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> So I do yeah. think social movements go through these purges for some reason. Yeah, well, it is interesting to look at the kind of the the the, the atheist movement that way because uh, it's exactly the same thing. You're right. I mean. You, you, you're you're not atheist enough. Uh, if you you know uh, on historical grounds, if you think Jesus existed, you're not really really one of us. You're kind of on the margins. Just just on, on a side note, just give us a couple minutes on what are the best arguments for Jesus' existence or, or not. Well, so yeah, so I try to marshal the the, the arguments in, in this book, and there there are a couple things. Uh, I mean, for one thing, uh, we have we have a number of sources behind our gospels. So, you know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, but these are all based on earlier sources, and these sources can be reconstructed to some extent. And so if, you, if you're trying to establish the existence of a person from the past, what you want are independent sources that all talk about this person. And when it comes to the historical Jesus, there are just tons of independent sources. These aren't reliant on each other. It's not that they're getting the stories from each other. They're independently attesting the existence right. without even questioning. And so th that's part of it. And one of, it, one of the things is that one of these sources, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, actually knew Jesus' brother, James, and tell, tells us about his right. brother, James. And he knew Jesus' closest disciple, Peter. I personally knew him. So it's not that Paul actually knew Jesus, but, I mean, he did know his brother. And so, uh, you know, if 
if Jesus didn't exist, you would, you'd think his brother would know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, those are, those are some of the reasons. Um, so uh, one of my columns in Scientific American I wrote on called What is Truth? I, you know, I said, well, so historically we can treat history as a science and we could say certain things factually about the past like Jesus existed or that he was resurrected because, you know, the Romans, I mean, uh, sorry, crucified. I mean, the Romans crucified yeah. people right and left. It, it would not be yes. surprising that he got yeah. crucified. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then to say he was e either resurrected or e even more of an article of faith that can't be proven, he died for my sins. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There, there's certain statements that, that we as scientists can't get at. Yeah. And, you know, the resurrection, well, you, you could conceivably make an argument, which people like William Lane Craig do, uh, yeah. oh, but, but to say something like he died for my sins, that would just, I don't know what you'd call it, just a pure, uh, uh, just religious doctrine or something. That Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I think that, I think that's completely right. And, you know, I, um, it, when, you're, when you're actually trying to do history, which, uh, which the, these Christian apologists claim they're trying to do history, but the reality is, that the only way you can do history responsibly is on the basis of shared presuppositions. In other words, uh, historians don't make claims that other historians won't accept simply because of the presuppositions involved. I mean, for example, if somebody wants to claim that the reason the Allies won the Second World War, no historian would say that it was because um, God intervened and made sure right. that... It, what, and just as nobody would say, well, it's because Martians came down and uh, <laughs> infiltrated the Nazis. And because, you, I mean, somebody might think that, but you can't make that as a historical argument because historians don't share the, the kind of assumptions that the argument's based on. Right. And so you can't say that Jesus was raised from the dead as a historical statement because it presupposes all sorts of theological beliefs that aren't shared in the historical community. Right. And it's not a historical argument anymore. It's a theological argument. Right. Yeah, you make that point early on in, in the, the triumph of Christianity that you're not making a statement on, on its success being because of uh, God or not because of God. or you know That's sort of irrelevant. Uh, it reminds me a little bit um, uh, back in the 90s when I knew Dr. Laura, uh, Laura Schlesinger. She had her popular radio show, and she used to make the argument that um, w you know, one of the arguments for God's existence is the Jews. It's like, how is that? They're still going. After all those persecutions, there, you know, there has to be the Old Testament God. The God of Abraham has to be the one true God. Because, look, the Jews are still surviving. It's like, yeah, boy, boy, what did he put them through? I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, I that's a hell well, of an I argument. Cuts both ways, yeah. Cuts both, <laughs> yeah, both ways. So, um, but the, so, so let, let, let's start in on you know, how you go from 20 Christians. At the, so Jesus is crucified in, in, in 30 AD 30, um, and uh, so there's about 20 Christians. Uh, they wouldn't have even called themselves that yet, right, at that, th uh, that moment? Or what would they yeah. have called themselves when he's still alive? Just followers well, uh, of Jesus. Yeah, they're followers of Jesus. They're Jews, and who are following, so they, they're Jews who think that Jesus is the Messiah, who's, you know, been raised from the dead. So they, they don't have a name for themselves yet. Right. Yeah. When does that yeah. come in? When, when do people start calling, whatever the Greek version of that is? Yeah, it's it's actually the same as the English. It's Christianoi oh, right. uh, Christians. So uh, they uh, it starts in the New Testament period. The term Christian appears in the book of First Peter. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, we're told that they that they started being called Christians in the city of Antioch. And so uh, we don't know. We actually don't know when, but a good guess would be sometime in the late thirties or early forties of the Common Era. Right, you have that uh, chart in here. I'm trying to find of of the of the increase in numbers uh, in 30 CE, 20 Christians. Then 30 years later, in 60, you have 1,000 to 1,500 Christians. And by 100 CE, 7,000 to 10,000. By 150, 30,000 to 40,000, and so on up to to the uh, you know 400 CE, where you get 25 to 35 million. And I love the point you make about, you know, to the average reader doesn't know statistics or growth curves, things like that. It seems miraculous. But really, like compound interest in a, in a retirement account, you, don't ha you only have to put a couple percent in every year and have it yeah. grow a few percent every year. And yeah. after, you know, a couple decades, you know, you got plenty of money. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And just, no, that, it, just a tiny just little like bit. So it doesn't require a miraculous, well, we, we'll leave out the true miracle, supernatural miracle, but, but not, nothing like a Billy Graham big tent yeah. every weekend converting thousands at a time. Yeah. No, that's what, I mean, and 
it's just what everybody just assumes. I mean, so I mean, I think just about everybody agrees that there's got to be about 20 when you start out, and just about all historians agree that by around the year 400, there it's probably about half of the Roman Empire, and the empire is usually guessed at about 60 million people, so about 30 million people. So you get from 20 people to 30 million people in in you know in under 400 years, and people just naturally assume you've got to have thousands of people converting at one shot. But you're you're absolutely right. It's, once you actually, if you have a steady rate of growth, uh, and what I what I try to map out is what the growth rate, what what the average probably was is around it's around three or four percent a year. Yeah. Uh, you know, if your money's growing at three or four percent a year in four hundred years, you're gonna be filthy rich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just found Twenty yeah. bucks, and you're gonna you're gonna right. be multi million. Yeah. <laughs> the power of compound interest. Yeah, it's the That's same it. thing yeah. with these these kinds of growth curves. So there's really only two ways to grow a religion: either conversion or fecundity. Uh, and so you have a well fecundity, not just having more babies, but they they follow the father or the mother yeah. head yeah. of family. Um, and so you kind of. Uh, address both of those, and, and 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 again, you don't need big tent revival uh, conversions. Where three or four, although you do make the biblical reference of three thousand and, and, and Jews converted in one shot, but that's probably mythic, yeah. right? That's mythic. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's that's complete. That's so that that's from the Book of Acts. You know, when the, fifty days after Jesus' resurrection, the uh, you know three thousand people convert. A few days later, another five thousand convert. I mean, right. yeah, that's just yeah, that's just legendary. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know when I, you know, when I did it, I was uh, 17. I went to a, the Glendale Presbyterian Church with my, my friend and his family. And, and, you know, it was sort of a calling up. It wasn't a lot of pressure. It was just like if you're feeling it, you know, you want to accept Jesus, you know, come on up. And, you know, a few of us went up. And it wasn't a lot. But you could see if, you, if, if it's that way every weekend, every week. And you yeah, just have yeah, this, yeah. you know, and then you go home and, 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 and you tell your spouse about it. And then they go and then your kids kind of go with you. And then they yeah. have kids. So the fecundity yeah. part, you know, you just have more babies, and the yeah, babies yeah. And, and people tend to follow the religion of their parents for the yeah. most part. Right. No, that's right. So uh, that's that's one of the points that I make in the book is that the um, it, it doesn't require a massive missionary effort. You know, it's not that Christians have some kind of mission board and they're sending people out to convert others, and it's not happening like that. So far as we can tell, there's almost no evidence of that. What there is evidence of is uh, a lot of things happening by word of mouth. And uh, one person knows another person and knows another person, which is how, you know, it's, it's actually how, what happens more often in the, in the modern world. I mean, you know, people, the Mormons are fairly famous for their, for their missionaries. The missionaries have almost no effect. Right. Uh, they, don't, right. they don't convert anybody. It's, it's, it's when you're living next door to a Mormon and you right. kind of like their lifestyle and you kind of you think highly yeah. of them, then you think about going to their church and then you convert. It's, it's more that kind of thing. Right. Yes, yeah, so and, and let's go back to what was there before. Of course, there was a small sect of Jews, but almost everybody else were pagan, whatever that means. And and it, I think you pointed out they wouldn't have even said, "I'm pagan." <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. Pagan is an out an outsider term to refer to these people, and it's it's usually thought that the that Jews made up maybe five to seven percent of the Roman Empire. So we're talking ninety five, ninety three to ninety five percent of everyone else is something else. And, but the something else isn't just one thing. It, it's lot, It's hundreds of, or thousands even of different kinds of traditional religions that are practiced in different different localities throughout the Roman Empire. Um, one of the tricks is trying to figure out what these various hundreds and thousands of religions have in common. And so I have a chapter that I try to explain what makes these religions alike in some very broad ways. I mean, for one thing, they're all polytheistic. They, they worship many gods. And sometimes there's overlap. They worship many of the same gods. Um, and they worship these gods mainly through cultic acts, by uh, acts of, of uh, making offerings, such as animal sacrifices. And they say prayers. And so each, each of these religions, has a diff- they might have different gods, and they might have different uh, kinds of sacrifice and different kinds of offerings and different rituals and practices and things. But, but, uh, but they're, broadly, they're broadly similar in, in these ways. So it's hard to put ourselves in the minds of somebody who lived thousands of years ago. But you know, if if if, if they're if they're looking out the window and seeing the wind, and the lightning, the storm, the rain. I mean, are they really thinking there's an, an intentional agent in there that is acting in the world and affects my life, and I have to appease them or appeal to them? 
Yeah, it appears that most people did think that. I mean, the the upper class philosophers who were uh, they sometimes were doubtful about it, but uh, it appears that the vast majority of people really did think that um, uh, that the gods were the ones who brought the rain. They're the ones who multiplied the livestock. They're the ones who made sure the crops grew. They're the ones who provided health if you get sick. Uh, they're you know the the gods are doing things for humans that humans can't do for themselves. And right. these religions are meant to facilitate that, um, so that you you give something to the gods. You you give them an offering of some kind, a sacrifice, or you just offer them some flowers or some incense, and you pray to them, and that's all they ask. And then they they give you what what you need. So um, a, a Christian missionary or someone like Paul, or whoever, just telling their friends next door neighbors about this religion in which. This guy died for our sins. He was resurrected. He turned the water into wine. He cured the blind could see, the deaf could hear, and so on. It's not so crazy because they're already thinking uh, this yeah. kind of stuff happens. Yeah, it's a big, big difference from the modern world where, uh, you know, a lot of educated people just kind of roll their eyes when you mention miracles happening because, you know, I mean, we, we, we live in a completely different understanding yeah. of how the universe works. But in the ancient world, uh, it's not that the Christians came along and started claiming they had miracles, and everybody said, oh, wow, okay, you have miracles. Everybody had miracles. Right. Uh, miracles are happening all the time. Right. Uh, for most ancient people, when the sun comes up, that's a miracle. Right. Uh, and it's no different from a God coming down and healing you of cancer. It's the same thing. I mean, it's God working in the world. And so the Christians are actually making common cause with pagans uh, in, in claiming that their God does miracles. What the Christians need to do is to convince a few people every now and then that the Christian God is uh, is more powerful right. than whatever gods they're being worshipped. I like the uh, what's the term he hemotheism. Um, hemotheism. Yeah. Hemotheism. So this is where it, 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 there's multiple gods, but you believe in only one of them, right? Or, well, you you worship only one of them, right? And so a hemotheist. So a mo the di differentiation is that a monotheist says there is only one God. Uh, and a henotheist, henotheist says, there are lots of gods, but there's one that's the greatest, and that's the one I'm going to worship. And, and that's what was in, in the cultural milieu at the time of, of this rapid growth, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so it, it isn't that um, Christians burst on the scene and said, there's only one god, and everybody said, uh, I've never heard of that before. A lot of people have heard the idea uh, that there's one superior god. Uh, a lot of, so there were a lot of henotheists, and, and there were Jews who were henotheists. I mean, even in the Old Testament, um, the, uh, the originally Israelite religion was henotheistic rather than monotheistic. So that in the in the Ten Commandments, for example, one of the commandments is, "You shall have no other gods before me." Right. Right. Well, that presupposes there are other gods. Yes. So you're not right. And so this, this idea of henotheism was spread throughout the culture, so people had heard of it. Um, Christians uh, played off of, of that. Uh, and I think the reason people, some people became henotheists is because they, they would be worshiping one God in particular, and they would praise this God and say, you know, you are, you're the greatest, you know, you are, you're the most powerful, you're the most wise. And, and after a while, this God is like the most everything, so why bother with something else? Right, <laughs> right? So, right. And so the idea that there could be one God who's to be worshipped uh, made a lot of sense. The big difference with the Christians is they said that when you worship this God of ours, this Christian God, you can't worship any of the others at all on any occasion, period. You just can't right. do it. Exclusionary. And they're exclusionary, yeah. Now, they, yeah. Did, did they go so far as to say they don't even, these other gods don't even exist, or you just shouldn't worship them at all? There were different views among Christians. Uh, some Christians said, look, they don't even exist. There are... You know, you've got these idols, these uh, these statues of the gods. They're just made out of wood and stone. There's nothing there. There's no reality there. They're just wood and stone. There are other Christians who said, no, in fact, uh, the gods, uh, the gods you worship, actually are superhuman beings, but they're demons. They're they're evil demons who are leading you astray. And so, if you worship the true God, you can't worship these demons anymore. So what were the central tenets that the uh, early Christians were presenting that made their religion stand apart and were possibly more appealing to uh, Romans and others? Well, uh, 
it's interesting that, that the main appeal is actually this point at which they're they're hitting hitting pagans on their own turf, which is that the gods are all power the gods are powerful and can give us the things we, we can't have. So when you when you when the Christians convince another, a, a pagan say, that their god can do these these powers, these, these great things, because they're exclusive, uh, this it's they're saying there's only one God who does this. Uh, and so when Christians convince somebody to worship this God, they're taking them away from paganism. Uh, and it's all based on this idea that their God is doing miracles. Uh, this is, it's kind of a surprising thing because, you know, I mean, I'm a historian, I don't believe in miracles, but it looks like the reason people are converting is because they think the Christian God is really powerful, uh, which means he can do things we can't do, which means he's doing miracles. And so it all begins with the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, they, they start saying, you know, he raised a person from the dead. I mean, how many gods do that? Right. And uh, right. and so the resurrection of Jesus becomes a central part of their proclamation. I mean, it's certainly the case today, modern Christians, that that is the central dogma of all Christianity. He right, he rose from the dead. Without without the resurrection, you might as well be a Jew. Well, that's exactly right. And, and if Christians hadn't proclaimed the resurrection, uh, right after, sometime after Jesus' death, I mean, not, not very long, we don't know how long, but in the New Testament, it's three days later, you know, on the right. third day he was raised, and I don't know, I don't know how much later it was, I, I doubt if it's three days, but it, you know, maybe it was three days, but they, they came, some of his followers came to believe he got raised from the dead, and that changed everything, because uh, Jesus wasn't planning on starting a new religion, he had no designs of starting a new religion. He was a Jew, uh, born a Jew. He was a Jewish teacher who taught the Jewish law to his Jewish followers. I mean, he was Jewish. Right. And he, he thought he had the right understanding of things, and his followers thought he had the right understanding of things. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if they had not thought he had gotten raised from the dead, they simply would have been a sect within Judaism, where, where they would adhere to the teachings of this one teacher, Jesus, as opposed to some other teacher, like Hillel or Shammai or some other rabbi. Uh, but the resurrection just completely changed everything, because once they became convinced he was raised from the dead, they had to figure out why did he die. Right. Uh, because if he's raised from the dead, that shows that God has, has really favored him. But if God... God really favors him. Why was he? Why was he tortured to death publicly? You know, is that what God does to the people he favors? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. It was enemies, <laughs> and so so the death itself had to had to be explained, and the reasoning happened very early on that that the death itself must have had something to do with salvation, fulfilling so, the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, no, actually, early on, they don't. I don't think they thought of Old Testament prophecies to begin with. I think what happens is. They came to think that if God raised Jesus, he must have uh, wanted Jesus to die. If he died, it must have been some kind of sacrifice, like a perfect sacrifice. Not like these animals were slaughtering in the temple all the time, but like this is like the perfect sacrifice. And once they thought of that, that's when they started looking at the scriptures to try and find out, are there, are there, any, are there any passages in scripture that are predicting okay. that God's chosen one's going to die? And, right. and so they started finding passages that that no other Jew ever thought had anything to do with the Messiah. But the Christians said, oh no, these are referring to the Messiah. Uh, and so that, that's how you start getting debates between Jews and Christians over, over the meaning of the Jewish scriptures. And what, what about the, the grafting on to the died for my sins? Me personally, I, you know, original sin, I cannot be atoned for this. Only Jesus can atone for my original sin. Yeah, well the logic... You know, the, the problem is we have to kind of piece together all this logic through just allusions to it. But, but Paul, Paul himself, Paul's our earliest author and um, of the earliest Christian authors. So his writings are the first ones we have. And you, can, you get a sense for how this thinking worked in Paul, and it may be that this is how it worked more broadly. Paul was especially um, concerned about the fact that Jesus had died by being nailed to a cross. And that, that specific mode of death was really troubling for Paul before he became a Christian, because the Old Testament says in the book of Deuteronomy that anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Uh, and so that means God's curse is anyone who hangs on a tree, and a cross is a dead tree, and Jesus hanged on a tree, so Jesus was cursed by God. And so Paul originally, the reason he persecuted the Christians is because they were worshiping somebody cursed by God as if he was the Messiah of God. And this didn't make any sense to Paul. 
But then when Paul himself came to think that Jesus had been raised from the dead, he had to figure out, well, then why did he get cursed by God? And he concluded that if, since Jesus was the one who was blessed by God, he couldn't have been uh, he couldn't have been cursed for anything that he had done wrong. And then then he started thinking in terms of how sacrifices work. An innocent animal is killed for the sake of someone else. Right. Yeah, not because of anything the animal's done. I mean, you know, it's not that the sheep has been a bad sheep and so you kill it. It's it's a substitution. Right. And so Paul and probably the people before him then started thinking in terms of a substitutionary death of Jesus, and that's how he, that's how you get to Jesus died for our sins. And is that where the cross itself becomes uh, such a, an important, almost talismatic symbol? You know, it's interesting that the uh, the uh, the portrayal of the cross uh, doesn't doesn't exist in the first three centuries. We don't have, Christians don't don't use the cross as a sign. Um, like in, in no early Christian art in the first three centuries is the cross ever portrayed. Oh. It, yeah, yeah, I know. This isn't well known because, you know, but the Christians were not going around wearing silver crosses around their necks. <laughs> that, that's, a, right. that's a much later thing. I mean, it's because everybody thought the cross is a horrible, horrible, shameful thing. Yes, and, yes. You know, it's like celebrating the electric chair or something. Like, oh, yeah, no, uh, I think it's uh, Steve Pinker makes a, a line in Better Angels of Our Nature to introduce that chapter on torture, this would be like Jews wearing a little shower head. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, just, right. What is this yeah. really symbolizing? Torture. I know. Well, what ends up happening is when when the, the empire becomes Christian in the 4th century, um, then the cross becomes uh, a, more of a symbol. Uh, and uh, because people are celebrating the cross of Christ as the way of salvation. And so the, the kind of... Um, awful associations then uh, tend to disappear at that point. Right. What about the fish symbol with the little Greek yeah. letters, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, that Christians wear? How old is that? Yeah, so that's that's probably older. We don't know exactly when it started, but um, some people may not know, you know, when people are driving around with a car with a fish on the back, why, why a fish? And it's because of what you say. That if you spell out the, the words, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, and you, it's an it's a, uh, anagram. So you take the first letter of each of those words, uh, and in Greek, the, the, the letters that result are there are five letters, and they spell the word fish. Right. Uh, the idea, though, that the Christians are hang, are hiding out in the catacombs and identifying themselves with the sign of the fish, that's just that's the stuff. <laughs> right. That's, yeah. So yeah. I also like your discussion on what, what would appeal to a pagan from a Christian and uh, I forget whose theory it was, the health care theory of uh, appeal, uh -huh. in, in, in a way because, uh, you know, there were so many things that could kill you in the ancient yeah. world, and anybody that offers something for, you know, healing the sick yeah. and, and uh, that kind of thing would appeal. Well, that's right. And, you know, there's a, there, there's a Roman historian named uh, Ramsey McMullen who, said, who points out that all of these pagan religions, whatever god they're worshiping, the one thing this god can do really well is heal. Uh, because this is the thing people are worried about. Because, you know, in the Roman world, um, if, if you had a tooth abscess, it would almost always kill you. Right. Uh, there's no way to control the infection. Um, and, uh, you know, women were dying in childbirth and, and children, infants, dying. In, in, the, in, in this period in the Roman Empire, apparently every childbearing woman had to have Six babies, six babies, in order to keep the population constant. Right. Because this mortality. So, so the healing business is big. Uh, so the person, the scholar you're referring to is uh, named Rodney Stark. He's a uh, sociologist of religion. Right. So he, he, he's not a, you know, he's not an expert in antiquity. Uh, he's not a scholar of early Christianity. But he wrote this book called The Rise of Christianity that tried to explain why Christianity succeeded. And one of his arguments was that. Christians had superior health care. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's kind of a clever argument. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't buy it, but it is clever. And what he argues is that during these early centuries, um, uh, there, were, there were a couple of epidemics in the Roman Empire, some rather severe epidemics. There, there was one during the reign of Marcus Aurelius at the, in the second half of the second century that wiped out between a, a fourth and a third of the entire population of Rome, of the empire. Uh, and it actually killed Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and so this massive epidemic, of course, there's no way to fight it. And um, what, what uh, Rodney Stark argues 
is that the early Christians uh, nursed their sick more than the pagans did. Because Christians have this ethic of love, and pagans don't give a damn. So, I mean, right. this is what the Christian sources all say, you know, which you, you really need to take with a grain of salt. And he doesn't take them with a grain of salt. He just says, well, yeah. the Christians said they were more loving pagans than they probably were. But what, what he points out is that studies have shown that, um, in, uh, that for uh, deadly diseases, uh, simple nursing improves survival rates even in the absence of medicine. Wow. And so... What, what Stark argues is that Christians were nursing their sick in times of epidemic, so they were more likely to survive, even without medicine, than those pagans who just let, the, let their sick die. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of an interesting argument, and, uh, you know, it's intriguing. The problem is, apart from just trusting our sources that these pagans were just letting their loved ones die without tending to them, apart from that problem, is the issue that actually our Christian sources themselves talk about. The Christian those sources that talk about these epidemics lament the fact that since the Christians are nursing the sick more than the pagans are, Christians are getting infected more often. Oh, right. <laughs> so, right. so after you nurse your mother, then they come in to take you out. And right. So the right. Christians are dying hand over fist, according to what the Christians themselves say. So I don't think it actually improved uh, survive, would have improved survival rates too much. What about community support, like today manning the soup kitchens, helping the poor, uh, you know, tending to the sick, that kind of thing, that, that aren't part of your family, but just in the community. Yeah. yeah. So this is an argument that's a little bit more plausible than a lot of people have latched on to, is that the Christian communities were providing things that were attractive to outsiders. Um, the idea is that uh, in pagan religions, uh, there's no, there are no communities, really, in pagan religions. You, it's not that... You, in a pagan religion, you're not getting together once a week to uh, to share your burdens and to pray for each other and to worship together and to study together and to you're not you know together as brothers and sisters who are taking care right. of each other. There's none of that in, in the pagan religions. Christians come along; they have all of that. They're brothers and sisters and supporting each other financially, but also morally and you know in every way. And so, wouldn't that be attractive to outsiders? Um, so there are a couple of things to be said about that. One is that Christian communities were actually closed. They weren't open and available to everybody. Um, so it wasn't like today where if you want to see what the Baptist church is like, you just go to the church on the corner on Sunday morning and check it out. You couldn't go into the worship services of the Christians unless you were already a Christian. And so the outsiders don't actually know what's going on, what's happening uh, in these communities. We do know what the outsider thought was going on in these communities, and it turns out it's not positive at all. Right. It's interesting that the, the common the common line about these Christian communities was that they uh, they involved weekly um, uh, weekly episodes of nocturnal orgies uh, where people are committing incest and they're killing babies and eating them. Uh, this is what they thought was going on. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, you, you get this rumor spread around. You find it in a number of different right. sources in the second and third centuries. And and the reason seems to be that everybody knew that the Christians were calling one us another brother and sister. They were meeting when it was dark because a lot of them were poor. They, they had to work during the day. So they meet in the dark. They're brothers and sisters. They greet one another with a kiss. And so, you know, they're, <laughs> these brothers and sisters are kissing, and it's like it's some kind of incest thing going right, on. Right. And they, they eat the flesh and they drink the blood of the Son of God. Oh, my right. God, they're killing babies. And so, right. yeah, so, so these are the rumors. And so um, it makes sense that outsiders would be attracted to the communal life of the Christians, but, uh, but it looks like that didn't, it, it just looks like that maybe didn't happen. And, and the, other, um, the other thing to say about it is we have a number of uh, authors who talk about why they themselves converted to Christianity or why other people converted and they never mention the community thing. Right. Uh, so it seems like, for those of us who are kind of sociologically minded, it seems like, yeah, that ought to be it, but right. uh, it doesn't look like it would Yeah, be. yeah. You have a chapter on the persecution of Christians. Uh, you know, all social groups, in a way, in a perverse sort of way, uh, like to be persecuted in a sense that it makes it elevates their group. We, we must be really on to something if they hate us. And that, yeah. that kind of fuels them from the inside. Like, yeah, we got to yeah. really stick together because they don't yeah. want us to grow. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, you can actually see this in this kind of ironic way in America today. You know, I, 
I have a lot of students who, um, uh, you know, I teach in the Bible Belt in North Carolina, and a lot of my students come from conservative Christian homes, and some of my students feel like they're being persecuted because they're Christian. Right. In America. Like, you guys are kidding me. Are you, in the American South, you're being persecuted? <laughs> wow. <Right. laughs> okay, but, but you have this persecution mentality because, well, you know, it does. It provides... It provides cohesion. It makes you think that you're on the side of the truth and that people are against you. And so there are sociological reasons for that. And that was certainly driving the early Christians, with the difference being that occasionally they were persecuted. Uh, they, the, the thing that people have uh, a misconception about is um, that it, it's widely, I think, widely in the population itself that the early Christians were declared illegal, that uh, it was against the law to be a Christian. And if you're copying a Christian, you'd be thrown to the lions. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't appear to have been that way at all. The, there were occasional persecutions of Christians here or there throughout the empire, but they were very sporadic. You don't have any kind of uh, imperial attempt to, to illegalize and to stamp out Christianity until the fourth, early 4th fourth century. Uh, and uh, for the first three centuries of Christianity, in most places, most of the time, it's perfectly fine to be a Christian. There was no problem with it. Be any, there might be an occasional uprising, but basically it was fine. So on the kind of highlights version of history we usually get, you have the conversion of Saul to Paul and then Constantine. Boom. Uh, so, yeah. uh, and, and you, you have a, a long section on Constantine. I mean, clearly something happened, but there's a couple of versions of what happened. And it played some role, but maybe not the not the major role that, that grew Christianity. Well, when I started in on the project, I, I had the view that I think a lot of people have, which is that the reason Christianity succeeded was because of the conversion of Constantine. So Constantine is the emperor in the early 4th century, um, and uh, he grew up a pagan, he's raised pagan, um, and he then had this conversion experience. He becomes a Christian. And when I started this project, I thought, well, that, that was the turning point. Uh, after Constantine, millions of people convert, and so it's because of, of Constantine's conversion. And at the time, I doubted whether it was a genuine conversion. I mean, maybe he was just like, thought that maybe Christianity could help him in his political, uh, in his political life. And so uh, those were my thoughts going into this, and I completely changed my mind about all that. You did, I think, yeah. Yeah, I... I what I try to show, this goes back to what we were saying earlier, I try to show that given the rate of growth that Christianity was experiencing, um, at the rate of growth it was going, Christianity was going to take over the empire, with or without Constantine. Right. And that if Constantine hadn't converted, then probably one of his successors would have, would have, right. would have right. done. Because just growing at this steady rate that they're going, by the time you get enough people, these numbers just start... It just the whole movement starts avalanching, and it's just going to take over. So I don't think that Constantine is the reason that it took over. I try to explain all that in the book, but the other thing is I really think that it was a genuine con conversion. Um, Constantine became a very avid Christian, uh, and he, we actually have we have some of his writings that he some of his writings, including the sermon that he delivered to a group of church leaders. And, um, you know, he, he might be talking through his hat, but I, he, it sure looks like he is really a committed Christian at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, in, yeah. in terms of, like, he, he accepted Jesus as his Savior and exclus, excluding all other pagan religions. Well, you know, and it, he did. And the way he did it, I would say, you know, uh, I would say he did it the reason most people did it, which is what we were referring to earlier, that, that the Christian God was more powerful than the pagan gods. So in the accounts we have, we have three accounts about what about Constantine's vision. Constantine had some kind of vision of uh, some kind of divine being that made him at first probably a henotheist and then turned him into the monotheist worshiping the Christian God. These three versions are all told by contemporaries, and all three are told by people who knew him. Uh, and so it's very interesting. To, to compare and contrast these three accounts because there are differences among them and it's a little bit hard to figure out what exactly happened. But it appears clear that what was behind it all was that uh, Constantine was in a... Uh, he was in preparation for a battle. Uh, it was, uh, th there was a civil war going on. 
and he was involved in the Civil War. And he came to think for um, fairly um, empirical reasons that the polytheist solution to divine power wasn't working very well. Because everybody else who was a polytheist who was engaged in this war was losing. And so he's thinking, well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there's one God who is powerful enough to... And, and he ended up converting to believe in the Christian God. And as it turns out then, he wins the battle. And he thinks, well, okay, this is effective. And so he spends his entire life thinking that this one God is more powerful than all the others. And he, he rejects the other gods and insists that, in fact, there's only one to be worshipped, and it's the God of Jesus. And he changes the law, uh, uh, or to, to what extent Roman citizens can go ahead and worship the Christian God without penalty. That's right. So some people have the misconception that Constantine made Christianity the state religion, right. uh, which is not true. Uh, okay. Constantine yeah, you not hear that, that all the time. You hear it all the time. It's absolutely not true. Uh, the Christianity did not become the state religion until the end of the 4th century uh, during the reign of Theodosius I. Um, uh, so it's it 50 years after, after Constantine. Uh, Co what Constantine did, though, is what you were saying, is that he made it, uh, he made it legal to be a Christian. He made it an illicit religion. This persecution that I mentioned earlier that started in the 4th century, uh, in the early 4th century, was undertaken by Constantine's predecessor, uh, an emperor named Diocletian. Diocletian required Christians to sacrifice the pagan gods, and when they didn't, they were punished. Uh, so this is the first time any there was this, like, this empire-wide attempt to stamp out Christianity. And Constantine converted uh, toward the end of that persecution. Uh, Diocletian uh, was taken out of the equation that the Civil War ended, Constantine took over power, and he and his co-emperor um, issued a, an edict of tolerance, uh, which uh, was uh, a statement that everybody could be whatever religion they wanted to be. They could be, they could be Christian, they could be Jew, they could be, uh, they could be any traditional religion of the empire. Any, every religion was perfectly acceptable. And so this was this happened in the year 313, and it's called the Edict of Milan, and it, it basically allowed for religious freedom of every kind. So then growth can happen maybe slightly uh, more rapidly because there's no penalties, at least legal penalties for it. So this is the this is an irony uh, that involves this exponential curve we've been talking about. Uh, Christianity had to slow its growth at this point. <laughs> you would think it would increase its, its rate of growth. It actually had to slow, because it, if, if Christianity continued to grow at the rate uh, that it was growing when Constantine converted, if it continued to grow at that rate, in 50 years there, there would have been 170 million Christians in the empire, but the empire had only 60 million inhabitants. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. the rate had to slow. Right. But the reason it slowed was because the more people who converted, there were fewer people to convert. Right, right. And so, yeah, so so the rate actually slowed, but they started coming in. I forget whose uh, law that is, Klein's law, I think it is. Any any growth curve that can't go on forever won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good law. Very good law. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I was thinking about that. So, I mean, there's 2 billion Christians today, 7.5 billion people. So, you know, we're, we're maybe 27, 28 percent. I mean, it's yeah. impressive, but it's not like the majority. Uh, well, yeah, that's that's right. And you know, because I when I when you go around talking, when I go around talking to to groups about you know why Christianity succeeded, I always have people who tell me it's because God did it. Right. And I always wonder. I mean, if God did it, why why hasn't He done it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot. Most of the people are not. And in, in any case, uh, I, I didn't have time to check the growth curves of Islam, but you know, starting in the eighth century, you know, now we're at a billion people, and you know, the, ge the geographical location is probably smaller than all of Western civilization. Uh, I, I, my guess is their growth curves are about the same. From say well, seven hundred, say eighth century to fifteenth century, something like that. Well, I don't know. It's a great question. I, I don't know the growth rate of Islam. The the, the most interesting comparative uh, analysis is actually with the Mormon Church. Uh, oh, right. So the, this fellow uh, Rodney Stark I was mentioning earlier, who had the uh, the health care plan idea, um, he he crunched the numbers. I mean, he's a sociologist, so he knows how to crunch 
population growth. And he, he crunched the numbers. And his argument, which I, I had to tweak a little bit in my book for a variety of reasons, but, but his argument was that Christianity grew at a growth rate of 40% a decade uh, up until the, the early uh, 4th century. And um, the thing about that 40% rate, um, if, you, if, you start with, if you start with 1,000 Christians in the year 40, a thousand Christians in the year forty, and then go to uh, three. Go go to six million in the year three hundred. It is a forty percent growth rate every yeah. decade. So, so what he points out though is that the Mormon Church has grown forty three percent a decade <laughs> since it was founded till today. Right. Which I think means in two hundred years we're all going to be Mormons. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so. Yes. Or Klein's law that any curve that can't go on forever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, but still, so, that's right. So you have Joseph Smith in what eighteen twenties, uh, yeah. And now Adam, I, 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 I don't know how many Mormons are. It's millions. Uh, I think it's yeah, like it's like, seven yeah. to ten million. Uh, so, uh, Certainly yeah. more than Scientology. I mean, Scientology was always kind of on the next next uh, on the list of cults that become mainstream religions if they survive the death of the founder. You know, yeah, which this yeah. uh, you know um, uh, Miskovich, David Miskovich, took over after uh, yeah. L. Ron Hubbard uh, moved on to the a great writing desk in the sky, <laughs> where, yeah, where right. apparently he's still channeling uh, more novels. Anyway, uh, yeah. but you know, I, I don't know if they will survive like Mormons. I mean, Mormons no. have kind of become more mainstream. I mean, most except for the fundamentalist Mormons that live right there on the border of uh, Utah and Colorado and some of those tiny little towns. Uh, most Mormons are about as mainstream, nice, uh, regular folks that you'll ever meet. And, well, no, sci well, all Scientology needs, though, is a, a Republican candidate. Yes, and, right. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe they'll they'll be revived. Yeah. Uh, just, just parenthetically, on your travels and, and, and communication with Christians, do they really think Trump is a Christian, or, or are they just are oh, they just pulling God. the lever for the Republican Party? Oh no, it's unbelievable. They, well. Yes, uh, many of them think that he is a Christian. They, they concede that he's not a very good one, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but that he's a Christian. But they, what they really think is that they are that he's God's instrument, and that that God is using this fallen person to bring about the uh, the the you know the the Christian social order. Uh, and so, really, it's you know well, you know what it's all about. It's all yeah. about abortion, and yeah. it's all I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's about these social issues, and it just. For me, as a scholar of Christianity, I find it just incredibly frustrating that um, that this entire social agenda has nothing to do with what Jesus himself talked about. Right, right. You know, when did Jesus yeah. become a Republican? Well, I know, I mean, <laughs> and it used to be, you know, I mean, the, just read the Gospels. What is Jesus concerned about? Is he concerned about, uh, you know, gun control and abortion? Uh, <laughs> He doesn't, I mean, and so what he's concerned about are the poor, the hungry, right. the homeless, the needy, the, uh, and the, the Republican social agenda has nothing to do with the poor. Right. Uh, just, uh, just, yeah, it's very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> so when did, when did that, that's really probably mid-20th century when that all kicks in, maybe second half of the 20th century when when, when yeah. Christianity morphs into this, this conservative Republican uh uh, doctrines. Yeah, it's uh, it's. I think it's with the moral majority. Uh, once the moral oh yeah, majority yeah, yeah, yeah. Nineteen eighties, right? Reagan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it really kicks in. Yeah. But there yeah. still are branches of Christianity that that do. I mean, most most cat most of the Catholic Church is more focused on that sort of thing. Although they they obsess about abortion, but at least they're against uh, capital punishment. Which is well, that's right. And, and you know, the mainline liberal Christian Protestant denominations still very much see themselves as as trying to model the the concerns of the historical Jesus. But it's it's part of the frustration is that those are the denominations that are losing members, and it's these conservative evangelical and Pentecostal churches that have these other agendas that are the ones that are taking off in the world. Right. Yeah, to my atheist friends uh, who've never really been to church or, or certainly never been to a me one of these mega churches, I tell them you got to go to understand what the appeal is. I mean, it's it's like a rock concert. 
Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. it's full immersion, uh, you know, the music and, and the standing yeah. up and sitting down and holding hands and singing and you know, free parking. I mean, yeah. in, in, like, <laughs> in Southern California, that's big, you know, and, yeah. and the yeah. community, you know, they're not there to hear a, a lecture on the, you know, cosmological argument or the ontological argument or yeah. the first cause and, you know, all that, like William Lane Craig stuff, you know, he's an expert at marching down his argument. People don't care about that. The regular yeah. person is not there for that. You know, yeah. so countering those arguments with better arguments against the, you know, five uh -huh. proofs of God and all that is a waste of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, no, that's right. And that's that's really where, you know, in the modern world where that community thing really kicks in. Because that's, that's what's getting people into these churches is this, the, the kind of, the, uh, what happens when they're all together just makes the biggest difference. And so those are the churches yeah. that are taking off. And that yeah. sense of persecution, again, you know, those Democrats, those liberals, the left, you know, they're all a bunch of atheists. It's like, wait a minute. No, most of them are Christians. I don't know. Democratic communists. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah and, and when did that happen? I mean, you know, Al Gore t said he was a Christian. Obama, you know, worshipped. He went to church every weekend. And pretty much all my atheist friends say he's secretly an atheist. I, I don't think so. I think Obama... No. We should yeah. believe what he says. Yeah, no. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Hillary against Donald. I mean, uh, Hillary actually goes to church. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she was far more Christian than he was, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's an, it must be an interesting as uh, time we live in the last couple of decades that, that you've been working to, to compare today to, you know, the, the, the early origins of the church. I'm curious about the, the whole business of what they thought then, or at least the scholars, uh, compared to now, on how Jesus could be both Son of God and God uh, and a Spirit, you know, three and one, one and three, and all that business of you know the yeah. problem, the problem of identity, you know, yeah. how did they square that circle? Well, so uh, this is um, this was a topic that I dealt with uh, in my book, how Jesus became God, uh, and what I argue in that book is that uh, you know, I, for me, it goes without saying, although most. Most people, I guess, it doesn't. Um, Jesus didn't think he was God. I mean, G Jesus was, uh, he was a he was a Jewish teacher who thought he had the right interpretation of the law and thought that, I mean, he thought that God had given him the right interpretation of the law, but, I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a rabbi, a Jewish teacher. Um, it was because he was raised from the dead that his followers started saying that he was more than a human, that he was divine. And the logic was that uh, there, there was an ancient logic which said that if somebody, if a human being is taken up into the divine realm, they are made a divine being. This is a view that's found in ancient uh, Greek sources, ancient Roman sources, ancient Jewish sources. We have, we have these legends of people. It's, I mean, the, the founder of Rome, Romulus, at the end of his life was taken up to heaven, and he became the god Quirinus, and he was worshipped by Romans as a Roman god because... The reason he became a god is because he's living with the gods now. Uh, you get this in uh, you, you get it in Greek circles as well, and you get it in Jewish circles. Even in Jewish circles, this is surprising to people that uh, there, Moses is said to be right. taken up into heaven and to have become a divine being in, in some Jewish text. So the Christians thought that Jesus was raised from the dead, and they, it's not that they thought that his body was resuscitated, you know, or that. Just that you know, his cadaver came back to life, or that he had a near-death experience, or something like that. Is that he was actually made into an, an immortal being and was taken up to live with God. And if for, for whomever that happens, that person becomes a god. And so the early Christians, I think, very soon started thinking about Jesus as a divine being. And it wasn't. It, it took a while for them to realize they had a problem on their hands because <laughs> if you're if a monotheist, <laughs> how's he a human being? I mean, what sense? I mean, is it that he is it that he became God? That's what the earliest Christians thought. They thought he became God, and then the question is, well, when did he become God? Was it at his resurrection, or, or, I mean, he did all these miracles, so wasn't he a God during his life? Well, maybe he became God at his baptism when the when God says, "You are my son. Today I have begotten you." So it's at his baptism he became God, and then. Other Christians start thinking, well, he must have been God for his entire life, right? So, oh, you know what? His mother was a virgin. God's the one who got her pregnant. Right. 
And so he was literally the son of God because God made his mother. And, and then people start thinking, well, he must have been God from before his birth. And so, like, he existed before. And so, so they start pushing it back. Right. And once they start pushing it back into eternity, and Jesus existed before, but then he became a human, then you get the problem of you know, how is he both human and divine at the same time. Right. Yeah, those are the debates that went on for centuries. Yeah, so, okay, so that's an, evol that's an evolving process. I like your discussion of the, of the appeal of the afterlife, you know, to what extent Christians offer an afterlife compared to pagans. Uh, that does seem to be an el a later element that gets a added on, because the pagans didn't believe, and if I recall, ancient Jews didn't, uh, uh, d didn't believe you were going to a place. You just go to n nowhere, just nothing. Well, yeah, it's hard to know. I mean, for both of them, so uh, this is actually why I'm really interested in this because this is the project I'm working on now for my, for my next book. Oh, it's what's on, that? Uh, well, I'm calling it The Invention of the Afterlife. Oh, nice. Uh, and so the question, I mean, it'll probably be called something else once it gets published. Okay, but it, don't call it this. <laughs> I will not. Because I already took that title. Yeah, That's my new book. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Although I'm more focused on all the recent scientific attempts to up mine, upload the mind and all this. But that got me into this problem of, you know, uh, what actually gets resurrected, uh, either Jesus or you, if you're, yeah. if you're there in heaven physically. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm 63. Am I 30? Yeah, uh, yeah, am yeah. I 35? Right. Well, you know, it, it's, right. Because yeah. supposedly Jesus, you know, Jesus was thirty when he was uh, crucified, right? So you're thirty when you're in heaven. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the early Christians had debates about this in the yeah, I know. early centuries. You know, I mean, what, uh, you know, what if you, uh, you know, what if you got injured? I mean, do you take your injury with you. What if you, right. what if you're born with a birth defect? I mean, do you, are, do you have right. to live forever? Or right. What if you were blind? You have to be blind. And so, yeah, Christians had to work all that out. So, so you, uh, I. I cite in my book uh, Julia Sweeney's monologue from her monologue Letting Go of God where she talks about the Mormon boys coming to her door in Hollywood and giving her the pitch you know and they give her the whole the, the whole pitch about how Jesus came to America and the whole thing and yeah, so yeah. She, she said I just wanted to tell him don't start with this story okay <laughs> <laughs> Even the Scientologists know, don't start with the story about the planets and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, start right. with a personality yeah. test. Anyway, but she has a funny thing where they're telling her, you know, the pitch about the afterlife, you know, the, the blind shall see and the deaf shall hear and you'll be made whole again. And she says, well, um, I had uterine cancer, so I don't have a uterus. Do I get my uterus back? And they're like, uh -huh. you can imagine these 18-year-old boys going, uh, <laughs> yeah. And she's like, I don't want it back. <laughs> and then she says, what if you had a nose job and you liked it? Yeah. <laughs> Do I have to have my own nose? <laughs> right. You know, okay, so it's not your body, it's your soul, whatever that is, it's the pattern. And yeah, but well, okay, but wait a minute, so what is that? You know, that it's all your memories. Okay, but my memories now at 63 are different than they were decades ago of my childhood, say. The memories are always changing. Yeah, so what yeah. is it that gets transported yeah. to this other place? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I know, it's a huge problem. And, you know, the, I mean, the, the traditional Christian view today is that, you know, you die and your soul goes to heaven or hell. And so, but when you press people on what that entails, I mean, if your soul, if your body's not up there, how do you recognize your grandmother, right? right. I mean, what? Right. <laughs> right. So, so uh, right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, well, I mean, this is the problem, like like Ray Kurzweil and these guys, the mind uploaders. You know, we're going to copy all your your connect them, uh -huh. copy all your memories, and put them in the cloud, which is yes. kind of like heaven. Okay, so, oh, all right, but which memory? All of my memories. The memories are yeah. always changing, and the memories of you know, all. Uh, what about all the people I interacted with? Are, are they there too? And and that gets reenacted. You know, basically, you end up with an argument in which you have a virtual reality, which the entire history of the cosmos and all of the cosmos is there well yeah. you know essentially it'd be like this is what we have now except we're living in the matrix or something like that you know yeah. the, you know yeah. and, and so the christians have the same problem that, that the mind uploaders have you know what exactly is happening here and the moment yeah. you start thinking deeply about it, it's like this is really messed up yeah 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 no i completely agree so well so the book i'm working on is where this idea actually came from that your soul goes to heaven or hell because it's as you were saying, it's not in the Old Testament, and it's actually not what Jesus preached. And so, why is it the why is it the standard Christian explanation then? Yeah. And uh, you know, where, where did where did it come from? Uh, so, what did Jesus mean when he said, uh, "Those of you standing here today will see me again," or whatever the words were? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. So the, what he said, what, this is it's actually quite quite interesting because he, what he says is some of, he's talking to his disciples and he says yeah. to them, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see right. that the kingdom of God has come in power. Right. And so what I think, uh, what, what I've long thought is that Jesus is not talking about what's going to happen to you when you die. He's talking about God bringing his kingdom here on earth to destroy everything that's opposed to God and everything that's causing all the problems here on earth. He's going to bring in a good utopian kingdom. Right. And that's going to happen before you disciples die. Right. Here on earth. Here on not earth. Not up there. No, it's here. The right. kingdom of God is going to be here. That's, that's yeah. what I, I actually put, speculate at the end of my chapter on that, that this is what he meant by the kingdom of God is within you, that, that we uh, have to create a better, a, a better uh, uh, you know, society here, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, so it's, it's, it's not, later that this whole idea, because, you know, the, the utopia is out there, it's up there, it's in the next life, not here. Well, that's right, and I, you know, I think, you know, my guess is that what, what happens is people really think that this world is an awful place to live at the end of the day, and they want a different world, and so they, they want the perfection that's going to come in the afterlife, and so, but it is, I mean, I do argue, that's one of the things that made Christianity attractive to pagans, the, um, a lot of pagans didn't believe any kind of afterlife. They just thought you died, and that was the end of the story. Um, so that they're, you know, today sometimes you go to a cemetery and you'll see a tombstone that says "R.I.P." You know, right. rest in peace. Right. And in, in the Roman world, they had a they had a different uh, set of abbreviations. It was seven letters. It said it, the letters were N.F. Uh, F. N.S. N.C. And what they stood for was, I was not, I was. I am not, I care not. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. You it's know, perfect. So, yeah, I so, think that was that was in this book, too. You mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. thought that was great because that, that, I, think, I forget who, I think it was one of the Stoics, Epicurus maybe, who said that you can't experience death. I mean, by definition... To, to experience something, you have to be alive. So it's not possible oh, yeah. to conceive of death because to conceive of anything, you have to be living. Yeah. So Christians, Christians did this interesting thing. They um, they created a need that pagans didn't know they had, and <laughs> right. then they then they solved the need. Right. Uh, and so the pagans didn't know that there was going to be a hell afterwards. Christians had to convince them that there was going to be a hell. And that if they didn't believe in the Christian God, they were going to go to that hell and be tormented forever. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're basically the only religion teaching this. Right. And uh, they don't have to convince a lot of people, but they're convincing a few people at a time, and it, it becomes an effective uh, evangelistic tool. Oh, I get the appeal, for sure. I mean, uh, atheists are always put on the spot. What would you say to somebody who's dying? You know, are you just going to tell them, tough luck, bud, that's it? Well, no, you don't say that, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but if you can offer something else, like well, like I'm, I'm reminded of one of my favorite movies, Ricky Gervais's movie, The Invention of Lying. Have you seen that? Oh yeah, no, no. Oh, it's great. Yeah, no. He, he lives in this world where no one ever lies. It's they always tell the truth, which has its ah. own set of hilarious things. But then along the way, he accidentally discovers he can lie. He, he goes to the bank to make a withdrawal, and, and basically the teller just asks him, "How much money do you have in there?" And he and he, and he he gives the wrong number, and she just gives him all this extra money he doesn't actually have, and he walks out going, oh, my God. <laughs> so then, of course, it's hilarity ensues where he's telling women, you know, uh, the world is going to end unless you and I have sex right now. She, and she's like, okay. <laughs> anyway, so, but then there's a kind of this, this sad moment where his mother's dying and in the hospital or whatever, and she asks him, well, what happens when I die? And it's like that pause, like, okay, here it is. Everybody gets a mansion, and it's a big, beautiful mansion, and all the food you want, and people waiting on you. And she's like, "Oh, that's just great." And then she dies, happy. And then, the, anyway, the rest of the movie is the word gets out that this is what he, this is the truth, and that wow. he's he's the Moses or whatever. And anyway, oh, he, he's in this hospital. He orders a couple boxes of pizza. And he uses the pizza boxes to make some notes to himself. And he walks out with, like, the, the Ten Commandments. He's holding up these pizza boxes. <laughs> and there's thousands of people out there like, so what, what happens then after you die? What else happens? And he just starts making stuff up. And he's like Moses anyway. So it's quite uh, funny. Uh, I mean, for it. sure, 
if I could say it, I guess I would, but I don't believe it. So, you know, this is always a struggle. You know, humanists have all kinds of things for, you know, secular weddings, secular funerals, the kinds of stuff you can say. Uh, but certainly at the time when, when the pagan religions weren't offering anything and then you go, you know, you're going to die and, and we have this extra thing. You get to go to this place. Yeah. And then when, when does it become like a cosmic courthouse? Like in all, you know, moral wrongs will be righted and the equivalent of Hitler would not have gotten away with it. And yeah, well, I think it starts off as that. I mean, I think, I think when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God coming, you know, again, he doesn't believe that he, he's not talking about your soul going to heaven or hell. He's talking about a kingdom here on earth. But I think this is all part of a, a larger theodicy, you know, that to explain why there can be why there can be so much pain and suffering, especially for the people of God. I mean, the the people who are supposed to be on God's side are the ones who are getting into the neck, getting it in the neck more than the others. And so, how's that fair? And so, well, God has to make it right, and so He's going to make it right by um, by destroying everything that is opposed to him and everything that causes the misery and pain and then making it a utopian kingdom here on earth. And because he's making right what was wrong, he's got to raise people from the dead in order to reward them if they suffered unjustly. And if they were they were schmucks, he's going to raise them from the dead to make them suffer. Right. Uh, and so the idea of a future resurrection was uh, tied up in this whole theodicy idea. And it's only later that that gets transformed into the idea, not that there'll be a perfect kingdom here on earth, but that there is a perfect kingdom up in heaven, and when you die, you're going to go there. If you're good. <laughs> yeah, no, well, no, yeah, if you believe in Jesus. So, right. uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah. Well, that kind of gets us back to where, where we started with the problem of evil as being an insoluble one for, for, for Christians, we think. Uh, but their solution is, well, you just don't believe in the cosmic courthouse where it's all settled. So yeah. I can see why that now is such an appealing element that didn't really matter to the to, 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 to ancient peoples as much as it does today. Yeah, you know when I when I first started thinking about the whole problem was uh, when I was teaching at Rutgers back in the mid '80s. Um, I was asked to teach a course on that was called the problem of suffering in the biblical traditions. Mm. And what I uh, what I did in this course is I looked I had the students read different parts of the Bible that had completely different understandings of why they're suffering. And so, you know, they had to read, uh, you know, the, the prophets of the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, and the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Job, and they had to read the teachings of Jesus, and the book of Revelation, and they had all the, and there are all these different explanations. Um, and it was interesting because almost none of these explanations have anything to do with what people say today. Right. right? So like a lot of people today... Uh, if you say, why is there such suffering? Oh, it's because of free will. You know, right. we have free will, right. and God has because otherwise we'd be robots, and we can't be robots, and so we have to, and so we hurt each other, which, you know, may or may, you know, okay, fair enough, but, you know, you don't have, you don't have authors in the Bible say, you know, after you're suffering because of free will. You know, <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So. Interesting. But it's, it's the perennial problem, and it's, and, it's no wonder that religions, uh, some religions succeed because they have what people find to be a satisfying solution to this. Right. Well, I'll be looking forward to reading that book. That, that sounds good. When, when will that okay. be done, do you think? Uh, well, I'm on, a kind of a, I'm on a kind of a system of trying to publish a trade book every two years. Uh, and so um, I, uh, I'm working on it now. I can, I'm probably going to write it this year, but they, they won't come out for another two years probably. And, and how do you decide what, what, what you're going to write about next? Is it just what, what, what you run into that tickles your fancy, or is there a certain direction of your you know, narrative arc for your life and you, you're heading in that direction? Well, I, have, I normally have about five books in my head that I really <laughs> want to write. Right. And I, usually, I kind of sketch them out a little bit. And what I end up doing is figuring out which one do I think is the most interesting to the most people. Oh, right. or, or could be made the most interesting to the most people. And so, like, with The Triumph of Christianity, that's the kind of book where you have to explain why it's interesting before people realize, oh, my God, that, God, that's, yeah, that matters. Yeah, you know, because yeah. This is the sort of thing you would just kind of think of. Whereas this next book on the invention of the afterlife, you know, where do people get, what happens to you when you die, that's something everybody's interested in. Yes. <laughs> where, where do you get that idea from? That, right. And so yeah. it's a kind of thing. And so um, 
Yeah, so I, I usually just pick whatever I think is going to be the most interesting thing there. That sounds good. Well, congratulations on the triumph of Christianity. Here it is again for our uh, listeners, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World. Bart Ehrman, thank you so much. Yes, thanks for having me. That was great. I will uh, let you know when we post this, and you can post okay. it on your social media. Okay, sounds good. All right, great. thanks, Bart. Okay, thanks, Take Bart. care. All right, bye-bye.